Ali, and welcome to Sidekick Podcast. And I'm really excited today in this episode to be talking with one of my best friends, a true martial arts legend. Now, when I first started this podcast, it was one of my goals to reintroduce legends like Mike Genova and others to a whole new generation of martial artists. Now, before I bring Mike on, let me just, just talk a little bit about uh, some of his accomplishments. First of all, he was a former top 10 nationally rated fighter in the tournament circuit back in the day. He's also a highly acclaimed martial arts instructor on the mat. And then thirdly, he's also the owner operator of Genova Family Karate, uh, one of the most successful karate schools in all of South Carolina. Welcome, Mike. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Keith. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited. We're going to be doing shorter episodes, and then I hope the audience and those listening or watching can also tune in to another one of the episodes. It's going to be really an in-depth one. But for this episode, I really wanted to focus on you being a fighter. Uh, you know, when you were a fighter, you were known as a cagey, analytical, smart fighter in the ring. That's what everybody said about you. And uh, as a matter of fact, the magazines also, during our time, voted you, now get this, as the number one defensive fighter in all of America. Now, I'm talking about thousands of fighters, and you are by far the best defensive fighter. So now let's combine that. You're the defensive fighter, best. You're analytical. You're smart when you fight in the ring. No, no wonder you're a top 10 fighter in the country. That just makes sense. So I just thought this would be a wonderful time for you to share some of your tips on, on you know, because we've got a whole new generation of, of martial artists that aren't aware of you or me or anybody for that matter, you know, the old timers. So I thought you could share some tips on how you became a champion. So go ahead. I mean, anything that you want to talk about. Well, well you know, Keith, during COVID, I had a lot of time to think, especially early on, and I sat in my chair and, and I brought out um, my old magazines and old books and old things like that. And I tried to figure it out how that evolved for me. And let me tell you what I determined. I determined it came from my earlier days as an athlete, as a basketball player. And when I was on the basketball court, I would look at people to see if they went to their right or their left, or if they shot, you know, how they shot, what they, what they did to, to let's say, uh, uh, telegraph what they were going to do. And I was able to be a good defensive basketball player. And I didn't even realize that when I got into the martial arts, that that's what I was doing. And so when I would watch fighters, I would say, well, that guy kicks on one side, punches on the other, or that guy closes his glove before he throws a punch, or, you know, this guy has no movement, or this guy really reacts to fakes. This guy does it. This guy is all offense. This guy's, you know, counter defensive. And so I just use those types of strategies to train. And then when I would referee and judge all day long before the black belts, uh, started, I would play that game as a referee. I would try to determine what they were going to throw before they threw it in the underbelts. And that's, that was my strategy and it worked for me. Yeah. Tell me this, if you had to pick or share with, with the audience, if you had to pick one technique, just one out of all the techniques in the world, what do you think is the most important technique for a tournament fighter? Side kick. Side kick. Exactly. Now, see, I knew the answer already. But I just wanted you to, you to say it, to confirm it and, and uh, reinforce it for the, for the listeners. But tell me why. I mean, why the side kick? Why not a round kick or a back fist or a jump spinning kick? Well, I think that the side kick is something that a lot of people don't work on very much. You know, they get it and they don't, they don't work on all the different aspects of the side kick. You know, you have your, your standing side kick, your pulling side kick, your defensive side kick, your offensive side kick. I actually do a fake you know, fake move with my leg, act like I'm going to put it down. And then when they start their counter punch, then throw the sidekick. I have all kinds of variations to my sidekick. I have a jump away sidekick. I have a jump away sidekick that goes low and one that goes high. I mean, I, I just work every variation of it because whenever you're throwing a punch, whether it's a ridge hand, a head punch, a back fist, a body punch, whatever you're throwing, you are open somewhere on your body for a sidekick. Where it is for a round kick and a hook kick, I mean, you, I think you're very, very limited. And flexibility really mm -hmm. comes into to take round kicks and hook kicks. Where it doesn't, you don't have to have a whole lot of flexibility for a side kick. And, and it makes sense. Plus, the side kicks, is just, I think, is the best technique as well, the martial arts. It's your stopping defensive technique. So if you have somebody that's faster or taller or stronger or whatever, they're not going to be worried about your back fist. You know, if there's huge, like, a, like remember Big John Jackson when he used to compete with us, he's not going to be worried about your back fist. 
He's not going to be worried about your round kick. He's going to eat. He'll come right, walk right through those techniques, but he'll stop in his tracks when you cook, cock that side kick and you, and you stick him with that, with that side kick. So that's the key mechanism to stop the fighter, which allows you time to set up your techniques. Right. And I, I watched a lot of videos during COVID and I watched instructors teach and I watched them when they were teaching the sidekick and they would say, uh, hit harder or something like that, but they didn't know how to break the sidekick down. They didn't talk about how you chamber your leg and where your foot positioning is and how your hip goes over it. You know, and then it's different. They're, they're not all exactly cookie cutter sidekicks. There's different ways to throw it for different situations. And that's what I worked on from day one. I worked on all the different ways to throw that sidekick and you did it as well with me. Well, well yes, yeah, so like expand on that a little bit. Remember we had the four step sidekick where you raise your knee up and then you throw it out, you bring it back and you put it down. It's called a four count. And you and I decided, let's get rid of number one, picking your knee up. The knee, we've got our heel to come straight up. Why don't you expand on that a little bit? That original sidekick, and a lot of people still do that sidekick. You know, you, you bring your knee up with your foot facing directly down and then you, then you cock your leg and then you extend it and then you bring it back. Well, we just eliminated, you and I, we just eliminated one whole step and it came directly up into your, your chest area so that it just made it that much faster, that much faster. You know, um, I, I don't look for accolades and, and you're very, you know, wonderful to do this for me, Keith, but I was at a seminar about three years ago and there was a young man that's a tournament fighter and he was telling the group, he didn't know who I was, that he invented the pull kick. Well, he was only, <laughs> yeah, he was only in his twenties at the time. And he literally said to the group, I invented the pull kick. Well, I remember in 1977, we were in Atlanta, Georgia, the night before the Atlanta Pro-Am, and you and I were in your basement of your house. You were wearing socks, and you were pulling across the floor doing the pull kick to try to figure out a way to beat Bobby Tucker, which you beat him the next day. And if I remember, it was either six or seven to nothing using that pull kick. So, yeah, right. I mean, a different variation of a kick. You know, and that's so smart. Plus... You were really good at movement as well. You know, we were pretty blessed uh, to be fighting at a, a wonderful time um, in, in the martial arts, and we'll expand on that in other episodes. But w a lot of times we were fighting standstill fighters because we were coming on, you know, we were fighting against guys around the country and around the world for that matter that were still standing still. And I think Joe Lewis kind of was one of the first, you know, uh, people to start really encouraging movement. And so we had the movement and then you had your sidekick. Right. And, and let me tell you my story on that. And I know this is controversial, but I mean, that's why you had me on, you know, uh, Bruce Lee in California watched Muhammad Ali fight when he was Cassius Clay and watched his movement in the rings and watched how he destroyed those other boxers like Sonny Liston, who were standstill boxers. And he just tore them up because they couldn't tell where he was, what the angle was. Bruce Lee started doing it. Joe Lewis started doing that when he was training with Bruce Lee. Chuck Norris started doing it. And these fighters, they incorporated what they were all doing and everybody was teaching everybody. That's, that is the beauty of it that we learn from each other and not just one sport, but, but other sports. I mean, I learned my lateral movement from basketball. I did not learn it from martial arts. As soon as we started doing lateral movement in the martial arts, I could already do it. And that was because right. of the basketball. Yes, absolutely. Well, let's touch on this too, because most of the time I've heard other instructors say the same thing. Be first, be first. So when you're in a competition and you line up and you have a center referee and he goes fight, and then you go, be first, be first, be first. And that person like Ray McCallum comes across the ring a hundred miles an hour, be first, be first. That's and so you didn't do that. You were smart. You had strategy. You were analytical. And sometimes you would fight. I don't care how long it took. But you were not going to have to be first. You were waiting for that opening. Right. So and was that part of your strategy? Yeah, absolutely. And when I would hear those instructors say be first, I would, you know, thank them because when they came in, I, said, <laughs> well, not fighting. I was fighting for grand championship in Greenville, South Carolina and uh, at Sam Chapman's tournament against um, uh, Mike Robbins, who became a good friend of mine from Savannah, Georgia. We were tied 2-2. And I remember Sam was the referee and he said, I'm going to disqualify you both, which he couldn't, if you don't go. And he was not going to come in because he was scared of my sidekick. And I just stood there and I, it was, I know it was five minutes and neither one of us knew. And then finally he just got so pressured. He came in, I hit him with the sidekick and won a six foot tall trophy. I'm very patient in the ring. I'll wait as long as I need to. Cause I know that be first when you want to come in, I'm going to hit you. 
You see, I think for the this audience and the, these new martial artists, this new generation of them, I don't think they've heard comments like this before because all they know is you got to go first, you got to get your point, you got to dive in with your point, and that's not how you how you fall. You were like I said, you were so smart in the ring, and and again, I just want to tell one quick story. I might do a story per episode, but I was fighting. We were both at a national tournament. We were in California, and I was in my ring, and I had just finished competing, in my finished winning my one fight. So as I'm sitting there, I hear my name and I hear Vitale, Vitale. Now we're talking about in California, this national tournament, there must be a thousand fighters. You're all the way on the other side of the arena. And I hear my name and I look up and I'm going, who's calling my name? And, and then I recognize your voice. He went, Vitale, get over here. So anyway, I really couldn't go because we got to get ready for my next fight, but I had a few minutes. So I rushed over and there you were. You didn't want to talk to me. You were in the middle of a fight. You were actually competing, fighting, and you wanted me to see it because you had set up the technique so well, you knew the final one was going to win the match. And I remember you had that sidekick and that sidekick, and then what you hit him with? Well, I, I hit him with, in the very beginning of the fight. He, um, he came up to me and he said, you're not going hit, to hit me with that sidekick because he must have read about it in the magazines or something. And so I said, oh, yes, I will. So we got in the ring and he just glued his arm to his ribs. He just glued his arms like, you're not going to hit me. And so I would hit him with a couple of hard sidekicks on the arm. And I would put a frustrated look on my face like, man, I really got to get the sidekick in. And I was doing that so he wouldn't move his arm. And then there was like 30 seconds left in the fight when I was um, yelling for you. Renardo Barden from Karate Australia was sitting at my ring right. camera. And I knew he was watching my fight and filming me. And I, and I knew I would had him set up for the hook kick because I knew he wouldn't move his arm. And it was literally like a, a, a drill in the school. Hold the pad. I'm going to hit you in the face. And when you got there, I waited for you to get there. I brought my leg up <laughs> on the sidekick. And he literally took his elbow and brought it in closer to his body because he knew the sidekick was coming. And I hit him square in the face with a hook kick. And it was humiliating to him. And I know he got mad at me. And, and um, Bernardo Barden got the picture. And you were there. And it was a, it was a great moment in California. It was at... Steve Fisher's tournament, actually, a good friend of ours who's now gone. All right. And I remember that the guy was so upset. Now, remember, this is not just some some low bear and white, uh, black belt. This is one of the top fighters. And top when you hit him, and, and when you hit him, his response was he was so upset, not just the fact that you did it and you called it, but the fact that you embarrassed him in front of me. He goes, you embarrassed me in front of Vitaly. But, right. but that's the point. I didn't know of any other fighter that could do what you just did. I couldn't do it. I could, you know. I just couldn't believe that you could set up your fighter and know it's like Babe Ruth hitting the home run. You're calling the home run. And what you did, you waited for me to get over there, and then you, you scored with that technique. And uh, it was wonderful. And it was great to have Bernardo writing about it and putting photos of it in the, in the magazines as well. Well, listen, well, Mike. Uh -huh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, no, no, like, no. it was like hitting a hole in one and nobody sees it. I didn't want to score that and have to tell you about it. <laughs> So when we go eat spaghetti in California and I'm telling you about it, you're going, oh, I bet it was nice. I wanted you to see it. <laughs> right, right. Oh, God. How wonderful, how blessed we were to come and fight in our era and, uh, and just enjoy each other's company. And it's wonderful. Listen, Mike, I want to thank you for this episode today, for sharing your fighting tips with everybody. And uh, again, I want everybody there to please check out other episodes. And if you like this one, please like it and share it with some friends and be sure to subscribe. And then uh, until next time, ciao.